The prison is deep and of stone. Its form, that of a near perfect hemisphere, though the floor, also of stone, is somewhat less than a great circle, a fact which in some way aggravates the feelings of oppression and of vastness. A dividing wall cuts it at the center. This wall, although very high, does not reach the upper part of the vault. In one cell am I, Sinekon, magician of the Pyramid of Koholam, which Pedro de Alvarado devastated by fire. In the other, there is a jaguar, measuring with secrets and even paces the time and space of captivity. A long window with bars flush with the floor cuts the central wall. At the shadowless hour, midday, a trap in the high ceiling opens and a jailer whom the years have gradually been effacing maneuvers an iron sheave and lowers for us, at the end of a rope, jugs of water and chunks of flesh. The light breaks into the vault. At that instant, I can see the jaguar. I have lost count of the years I have lain in the darkness, I, who was young once, and could move about this prison and incapable of more than awaiting in the posture of my death, the end destined to me by the gods. With the deep obsidian knife I have cut open the breasts of victims, and now I could not without magic lift myself from the dust. On the eve of the burning of the pyramid, the men who got down from the towering horses tortured me with fiery metals to force me to reveal the location of a hidden treasure. They struck down the idol of the god before my very eyes, but he did not abandon me, and I endured the torments in silence. They scourged me, they broke and deformed me, and then I awoke in this prison from which I shall not emerge in mortal life. Impelled by the fatality of having something to do, of populating time in some way, I tried, in my darkness, to recall all I knew. Endless nights I devoted to recalling the order and the number of stone-carved serpents, or the precise form of a medicinal tree. Gradually, in this way, I subdued the passing years. Gradually, in this way, I came into possession of that which was already mine. One night, I felt I was approaching the threshold of an intimate recollection. Before he sights the sea, the traveler feels a quickening in the blood. Hours later, I began to receive the outline of the recollection. It was a tradition of the god. The god foresaw that at the end of time there would be devastation and ruin. And on the first day of creation, he wrote a magical sentence with the power to ward off those evils. He wrote it in such a way that it would reach the most distant generation and to ensure that chance would not touch it. No one knows in what characters it is written, nor where it is written, but it is certain that it exists as a secret, and that a chosen one shall read it. I considered that we were now, as always, at the end of time, and that my destiny as the last priest of the god would give me access to the privilege of intuiting the script. The fact that a prison can find me did not forbid my hope. Perhaps I had seen the script of Koholam a thousand times and needed only to fathom it. This reflection encouraged me, and then instilled a kind of vertigo. Throughout the earth there are ancient forms, forms incorruptible and eternal. Any one of them could be the symbol I sought. A mountain could be the speech of the god, or a river, or the empire, or the configuration of the stars. But in the process of the centuries, the mountain is leveled and the river will change its course. Empires experience mutation and havoc, and the configuration of the stars varies. There is change in the firmament. The mountain and the star are individuals, and individuals perish. I sought something more tenacious, more invulnerable. I thought of the generations of cereals, of grasses, of birds, of men. Perhaps the magic would be written on my face. Perhaps I myself was the end of my search. That anxiety was consuming me when I remembered the jaguar was one of the attributes of the god. Then my soul filled with pity. I imagined the first morning of time. I imagined my god confiding his message to the living skin of the jaguars, who would love and reproduce without end in caverns and cane fields on islands in order that the last men might receive it. 
I imagined that net of tigers, that teeming labyrinth of tigers, inflicting horror upon pastures and flocks in order to perpetuate a design. In the next cell, there was a jaguar, and in his vicinity I perceived a confirmation of my conjecture and a secret favor. I devoted long years to learning the order and the configuration of the spots. Each period of darkness conceded an instant of light, and I was able thus to fix in my mind the black forms running through the yellow fur. Some of them included points. Others formed cross lines on the inner sides of the leg. Others, ring-shaped, were repeated. Perhaps they were a single sound or a single word. Many of them had red edges. I shall not recite the hardships of my toil, more than once I cried out to the vault that it was impossible to decipher that text. Gradually, the concrete enigma I labored at disturbed me less than the generic enigma of a sentence written by a god. What type of sentence, I asked myself, will an absolute mind construct? I considered that even in the human languages there is no preposition that does not imply the entire universe. To say, the tiger, is to say the tigers that begot it the deer and turtles devoured by it, the grass on which the deer fed, the earth that was mother to the grass, the heavens that gave birth to the earth. I considered that in the language of a god, every word would enunciate that infinite concatenation of facts, and not in an implicit, but in an explicit manner, and not progressively, but instantaneously. In time, the notion of a divine sentence seemed puerile or blasphemous, a god, I reflected, ought to utter only a single word, and in that word, absolute fullness. No word uttered by him could be inferior to the universe or less than the sum total of time. Shadows or simulacra of that single word equivalent to a language and to all a language can embrace are the poor and ambitious human words. All. World. Universe. One day, or one night, what difference between my days and nights can there be? I dreamt there was a grain of sand on the floor of the prison. Indifferent, I slept again. I dreamt I awoke, and that on the floor there were two grains of sand. I slept again. I dreamt that the grains of sand were three. They went on multiplying in this way until they filled the prison and I lay dying beneath the hemisphere of sand. I realized I was dreaming. With a vast effort, I roused myself and awoke. It was useless to awake. The innumerable sands suffocated me. Someone said to me, You have not awakened to wakefulness, but to a previous dream. This dream is enclosed within another, and another, and so on to infinity, which is the number of grains of sand. The path you must retrace is interminable, and you will die before you ever really awake. I felt lost. The sand burst my mouth, but I shouted, A sand of dreams cannot kill me, nor are there dreams within dreams. A blaze of light awoke me. In the darkness above there grew a circle of light. I saw the face and the hands of the jailer, the sheave, the rope, the flesh, and the water jug. A man becomes confused gradually with the form of his destiny, for a man is, by and large, his circumstances. More than a decipherer or an avenger, more than the priest of the god, I was one imprisoned. From the tireless labyrinth of dreams I returned as if to my home to the harsh prison. I blessed its dampness. I blessed its tiger. I blessed the crevice of light. I blessed my old, suffering body. I blessed the darkness and the stone. Then there occurred what I cannot forget, nor communicate. There occurred the union within the divinity, with the universe. I do not know whether these words differ in meaning. Ecstasy does not repeat its symbols. God has been seen in a blazing light, in a sword or in the circles of a rose, but I saw an exceedingly high wheel, which was not before my eyes, nor behind me, nor to the sides, but every place at one time. That wheel was made of water, but also of fire, and it was, although the edge could be seen, infinite. Interlinked, all things that are, were, and shall be formed it, 
and I was one of the fibers of that total fabric, and Pedro de Alvarado, who tortured me, was another. There lay revealed the causes and the effects, and it sufficed me to see that wheel in order to understand it all without end. Oh, bliss, bliss of understanding, greater than the bliss of imagining or feeling. I saw the universe, and I saw the intimate designs of the universe. I saw the origins narrated in the Book of the Common. I saw the mountains that rose out of the water. I saw the first men of wood, the cisterns that turned against those men, the dogs that ravaged their faces. I saw the faceless god concealed behind the other gods. I saw infinite processes that formed one single felicity, and understanding all, I was able also to understand the script of the tiger. It is a formula of 14 random words, they appear random, and to utter it in a loud voice would suffice to make me all-powerful. To say it would suffice to abolish this stone prison, to have daylight break into my night, to be young, to be immortal, to have the tiger's jaws crush Alvarado, to sink the sacred knife into the breasts of Spaniards, to reconstruct the pyramid, to reconstruct the empire. Forty syllables, fourteen words, and I, Sine Khan, would rule the lands Moctezuma ruled. But I know I shall never say those words, because I no longer remember Sine Khan. May the mystery lettered on the tigers die with me. Whoever has seen the universe, has beheld the fiery designs of the universe, cannot think in terms of one man, of that man's trivial fortunes or misfortunes, though he be that very man. For that man has been he, and now matters no more to him. What is the life of that other to him, the nation of that other to him, if he now is no one? This is why I do not pronounce the formula. Why, lying here in the darkness, I let the days obliterate me.